Thanks for choosing this free Anfield Index podcast. If you'd prefer to listen to this or any of our other shows without adverts, then now's the time to check out Anfield Index Pro. With AI Pro, you can supercharge your entire listening experience. You'll not only get all of our podcasts without the ads, but you'll have them far faster with our quick publish feature available exclusively for subscribers. AI Pro also puts you in the heart of our sound studio, with an option to listen to many of our shows live and interact with the podcasters in real time as the shows are recording. Upgrading couldn't be easier. AI Pro is available on all popular podcast platforms, and we have our own apps for Apple and Android. Just head on over to AnfieldIndexPro.com and get started today. Hello and welcome to your post-match Raw on AI Pro podcasting to you from my field here in beautiful rural Ireland. And live on Discord, I'm Trev Downey. And join me to give their immediate reactions to Napoli 4, Liverpool 1 in the Champions League are Dave Hendrick and Carl Matchett. I have to say, Dave, that's I, I know the stats will back up the point I'm about to make here, but just um, from a personal point of view as a fan, that is absolutely the worst uh, away display I've seen in Europe. Uh, sorry, display I've seen in Europe from Liverpool uh, for quite a while, I have to say, if ever. I was reminded of the 3-0 on the Brudge era um, towards the end there uh, against Real Madrid, and that was a painful evening for sure. But this matches it because what's worse here is that we have personnel. What's worse here is that there is a team that should go out and actually hand Napoli their arses. But between incompetence in the performance and incompetence in the setup, uh, we got anything but that. Trev, that was a disgrace. That was an absolute disgrace. That first half was nothing short of a shambles. We should have been 5 0 down at half time and that's not hyperbole they missed a penalty and Virgil had to clear one off the line we got absolutely destroyed we had I think on the night three players who come out of there with even the slightest bit of credit the goalkeeper Luis Diaz and Thiago I would absolve Fabinho of blame because he was once again abandoned in midfield by himself and I wouldn't put any blame on Arthur, on um, Jota or on Nunes who I thought all tried when they came on and tried to make things happen and get involved but the rest of them that was an absolute disgrace and I don't even know where to start but it the, the book stops and ends yeah, starts and ends with, with Jurgen Klopp. Because he put that team out there. And he's the one that stood there looking completely bemused as his team got torn apart. Looking completely surprised that his team were 3-0 down at half time. Why are you surprised? This has been coming. This arse kicking has been coming. We have played... Bad teams in the Premier League thus far this season. Bad teams. We have not played one good team yet. And yet we've dropped points in, what, four games? This was coming. And this was earned. And this was deserved. And I really fucking hope the message gets through. Because there was an arrogance about the way Liverpool set up against Everton. There was an arrogance about the way they set up tonight. I text Gags, and Gags will confirm this to anyone that asks. I text Gags a few days ago. Let me see. What day was this? Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, I don't even know. It was the 4th of September. So, what, three days ago. I texted him and said, I think Napoli will batter us. Because the way we've been playing, the attitude of these players... The attitude of the manager, it has been a disgrace, an absolute disgrace. And I've said this before, and now I think I'm right. I think the Jurgen Klopp era at Liverpool, where Liverpool are competing for titles and Champions Leagues, is in serious danger of being over. And this might just become 
a team that finishes third or fourth and wins a domestic cup every couple of years because it's gone stale. It's been allowed to go stale. There's been absolute negligence in the refreshing of this team and especially in the midfield area. And all we're going to do now is waste a peak year of five world-class players among the very best in the position, among the very best we've ever had at this club. We are going to waste that year because we have a manager who was too arrogant to see what was in front of his face all of last season throughout the summer. Yeah, I look. I, I mean, anyone who's been listening to AI shows has been hearing me say something very similar about um, not wanting to see this era wasted. Uh, and it can come across, I understand, to fans of other clubs as entitled. Uh, it can come across to certain precious um, uh, individuals amongst the Liverpool fan base as entitled. And I couldn't give a shit what they think because honestly... I have been following this club as long as I've been breathing and all I want to do is see them win trophies and I couldn't give two craps about your happy, happy zone where we are, no. you know, in the zone and we're competing. Fuck off. Yeah, win trophies. Win, win trophies. trophies. You End know what? Do people story. not know what club they support? They, they bleat on about how they're, you know, how it's about supporting the team. Do you know what club this is? This club doesn't exist to be in the mix. This club doesn't exist to compete. I don't want to hear, just enjoy it ever again. Enjoy what? Maybe you in your life enjoy losing. Maybe that's who you are as a person. That's not me. That's not this club. That's not this club. This club was built on the back of two men. Bill Shankly and Bob Paisley, and they'd be fucking disgusted by what we witnessed tonight. And they'd be disgusted by the attitude of those super fans who think they're better than everybody else talking down to them because people aren't happy with second place. Carl, you can understand, can't you, that a lot of people have a, a tendency to want to just say, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. And in no way, can I just be clear? In no way. Uh, is 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 are we are we making any big bold predictions that it's all gone to fuck now and it'll never come back? But there are trends here that we need to address, and you can understand that people are protective and they want to they want to hang on to their happy thoughts. But when you see things so systematically awful, when you see players so wretchedly out of form and then an awful lot of people are leaning into the exhaustion narrative, and I think I've put this to you before. Uh, you know, I've seen one or two lads do that. Oh, they're, they're, our, our boys are knackered. Right. It's not really washing with me that I have to say, we had a long season. Okay. Uh, again, n not good enough. And it doesn't, for me, come anywhere near to explaining what's going on. And I know this is an impossible question, Carl, because it is something that... I think as you look at the at the touchline, you got you've got people in charge of the team there who don't know the answer to it. But I mean, what do you think we're looking at here? Do you fear that it's it's in danger of stagnation, like Dave is Dave is worried is the worst case scenario here? I don't think that you can say we're we're worried that it could be in danger of stagnation. It, it kind of already is, to be honest. We're already there. Um, I think that one of the most dangerous things is if we say. Or if we don't hurry up and do this, it's going to be this. It, we're already there. We're already, like, the best part of a month into the season now, and we've not had a good performance yet. We've not had a, a good 90-minute performance. It's, it's not what we've been expecting for a long time. It's not what we've been known for. We're so far away from the, the style of performance, let alone the level of performance, that it, this is already happening now. Like, th this is... A much, much shorter version of what we've been saying about Man United for the last few years and what happened to us for decades, where you say like, oh, yeah, well, you know, we're, we're, we're rebuilding or we're in transition or whatever, and that you you will get to the bottom of it. And then before you know it, a season has gone and you haven't, and five seasons have gone and you haven't. Well, we're, we're now a month in already and we haven't got to the bottom of it. And this has been the same performance type since the opening day of the season. And we've had the same issues since the opening day of the season. And they might have gotten a bit worse because of additional injuries and all the rest of it, but it's nothing has been done about it yet. There has not been something else 
tried to be done to fill those gaps in midfield to to replace the uh, energy which has been missing to to add physicality to certain uh, fixtures where it's been obviously required it hasn't happened and just sleepwalking at the minute that's all i can really say about it indeed um but when 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 you try to when you try to pull it apart, that word that you mentioned earlier on, that was part of the discourse very recently as well. That was another one um, that we were, we were hearing um, from various quarters. And it, I can see how it's a nice crutch, the concept of transition. It's a transitional season. But again, to the point, and just to get your take on this, just so your definitive take on this as well, just see where you are on the point that I think, I think, Myself and Dave were kind of clear where we are on it, but who says we're right? This concept of a transitional se- uh, season, like I said, it's, 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 it's an easy thing to hide behind. I think it holds no water whatsoever. And for me, the problem with it, Carl, is that it presupposes that that is a necessity. It's not a necessity. If we recruit properly in time, then it's not a necessity. Transition does not need to be a thing that we endure. It can be something that actually makes us better. So what's your take on all of this kind of angle around uh, an excuse for the team? Um, no, I don't think it can be any kind of an excuse for the team, not not in terms of the players. I don't think there's anything that you can like let off the hook here. They've They've been in this league long enough. Even the people who have arrived now, they've been playing for... Um, teams who have been competing for trophies. You can't tell me that, I'll take Darwin Nunez for an example because he's a big money signing, that Benfica play as slowly as, as we do. They don't that they don't come up against teams who are as hardworking and as aggressive as the sides that we've played this season. They do. It, it's a different style and it's a different level of quality and all the rest of it, but they still, know, they still know themselves going out there and performing as they have done in that first half. What they do there is never going to get you a win at this level, ever. At any point is that, I mean, bloody hell, speaking about the worst ones that you've seen, the only one I can pick out from this era, let's say, is the Red Star away one. That was like a proper abomination of a European performance. Adam Lallana in midfield. Yeah, but that was against a team who was like, with all due respect, not that good technically. Mm -hmm. They were set up well and they massively outworked us and all the rest of the stuff that Napoli did tonight, except Napoli are actually five levels better than that. And you know what? If people didn't watch the earlier game, the best team in this group tonight on match day one was Ajax, who we play next. So in terms of letting the players off the hook or how much responsibility do they bear and all the rest of it, loads. I'm not going to say all of it because obviously the coach and staff and Klopp does as well in terms of the setup and how they're told. But there's, there's, I, I refuse to believe at any point at all that, oh, take whoever you want, pick any of that back line tonight, that they're not told to be in certain positions tonight, that they're not told to follow the runners that we gave a goal away with uh, two matches ago and that we did three matches ago and that we did again tonight with just a really, really simple third man run or a wall pass and the guy who had the ball in the first place is running behind and nobody goes with them, that's rubbish. That is on the players. They're good enough. Yeah, their it's experience. basic it's fundamentals. But it's, it's effort it's as like well. There's, there's no stuff. effort. You can like. see it happen. You can see it happen, happening three passes before. Yeah. That's how obvious it is. So if we can see that coming, they definitely know about it. So there's no excuses or letting them off the hook or anything, like, even if the managerial or coaching decisions beforehand are abysmal as well. Oh, they're not getting let off the hook. Don't you worry. I've got nooses for every one of them. I'll string every one of them up tonight. But this club got really arrogant in 2020 because in 2019, we won the European Cup and we finished second in the Premier League and we were the best team in Europe. We were the best team in Europe. Only City could have made a case and we won a European Cup and they didn't. And they beat us to the league by inches, not miles, inches. We were the best team in Europe and we bought nobody. We bought nobody. You always strengthen from a a winning position. You always do that. When you're the number one team, you put your foot on the throat of the rest of those teams and you keep them down as you continue to build. It's what Paisley did. It's what Shankly did before him. And we did nothing. But we won the league the next year. And Liverpool took that to mean, well, we were right with what we did and patted themselves in the back. And they went and recruited that summer. But they recruited the three things we had needed the previous summer. And then the following summer, they just bring in Ibu, having left themselves short 
of a centre back the year before, which, as it turned out, cost us massively. But they just brought in Ibu. A year too late, they bring him in, and they don't address the midfield. And that cost us last season. And this season, we wouldn't have brought in a midfielder if Henderson had gotten hurt or ha- hadn't gotten hurt because Klopp was going to be happy to let it play out. Because there's an arrogance about this team that they can just rinse every last bit out of it and the results will speak for themselves. And the results are speaking for themselves. I think that arrogance, that team that you're talking about is the bigger team in general, right? Because yes. it is... A- oh yeah, not just the football team. I'm talking yeah. about the club in general. Yeah. I'm talking about the recruitment team, the analytics team, the management team, the financial team. Every single department of that club got lazy. It got arrogant and then got lazy. Well, it's very and hard. Just to thought it could carry on. It's very hard to see what. It's very hard to make arguments against that because there is some sort of attitudinal change. That's for sure. It's across the board. Uh, there is some sort of. Uh, I mean, look. Let's address the elephant in the room for a second before we get into the usual uh, rigmarole here with the, the 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 layout of the show. I mean, everybody's talking about it in the in the chit chat there beforehand. Um, and I'm not one for um, over analysing minutiae, but when you come down to it, there is a horrible, stinking irony in the uh, uh, title of, of of Pep's book because the, you know the if you look up intensity, I'm pretty sure the uh, the opposite of that is apathy, mm. and and that that Dave is what we're seeing several times on a pitch during a game as lads. Just let fellas ro- stroll by them uh, yeah. or jog past them. There was a couple of goals there tonight, and you're just honestly scratching your head going, do you actually give a fuck? You've been done up like a kipper there. Mm. It's embarrassing. Look at and their he- third goal. Look at their third goal. Kavicha knocks it past Trent, and Trent just decides, nah, that's my part done. I'm not going to oh, do he- anything else. Absolutely jacked it in there. Jacked and just gave in. up. Just gave up. Just absolutely gave up on it. So, the, if, the so if you goal was the same thing. So if uh, you are, if you're, if you're world class, emerging world talent like Trent Alexander uh, uh, Arnold with incredible talent and every the world in front of you and a, and a, and a platform to do your thing on. What I'm saying is, do we narrow in on the individuals here, or do we actually get back to what we were both sort of driving at there that there is some sort of attitudinal change or arrogance or apathy or laziness which has ironically crept in in the season of the intensity well, I think it's book. a collection of, in- of, of issues a collection of it but like <clears throat> the thing is a club as smart as Liverpool think they are would have signed a quality backup for Trent a couple of years ago someone that wasn't an 18 year old they would have signed a quality backup you know like we did with Costas on the other side we'd have a right sided Costas yeah, And Klopp would be able to say to Trent, until your fucking attitude improves, until your effort levels improve, you go sit yourself in the stands. You're not even making the bench. Go and sit yourself in the stands. Right-sided Costas will cover for you for a month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's it. And, as lo- and it doesn't matter how bad he plays, because if he gives me 100%, you can sit your ass in the stands. And when your family and your friends and all the local people ask you why you're not playing... You tell them it's because you don't bother your arse. Because you've gotten far too big for your boots. And it does just appear like Trent right now might be a little bit too big for his boots. And he started last season really poorly as well. Was it last season? No, the season before. Season before that. Remember he got COVID? Yeah. Remember we went to Austria and he got COVID? And he was shit for like three months. And we went to Austria this summer. And he's shit. And I wonder, has, did he catch COVID or something again? Because it can't, like, this kid, the club matters more to him than any of his teammates. Any of them. It means more to him than anyone else at the club, bar maybe Curtis and any other local young lad. This is the scouser in the team. This lad is an icon in the city. So it just, there's, there's got to be something wrong for him to be displaying. Like, I can forgive someone for having a bad game if they put the effort in. 
a world class player like him is going to have a couple of off days. Might have a bad month. But a misplaced pass is one thing. Turning and stopping and looking as your man goes racing forward to create another goal is something completely different. 100%. And in response to Owen Hurley there in the chat, yeah, absolutely. Rob was off it too. And uh, we're just talking about one guy because we can only focus on one at a time. But I, I would imagine, as Dave said earlier on, an awful lot of fellas are going to find themselves between the crosshairs on this show because you don't get to do that. You don't get to do that uh, as Liverpool Football Club. You certainly don't get to do it in this era where we expect so much and uh, rightly so. Um, so I'm going to push us on through our um, normal uh, scheduling here and have a look at the two teams with you. And Dave, just to stay with you briefly on the, the Liverpool selection, because quite often um, we talk about this and it's it's something that just needs to be addressed immediately. Everybody was sort of uh, hazarding a guess that uh, the selection of, 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 of old Jimbo would... Uh, have you in 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 um, dire straits? Um, but the point, of course, is that you look at the bench and Thiago is not ready to start. Okay, uh, you have a look at the bench. Arthur is there, uh, and the kid uh, Bacetic is there. That's your lot. That's your lot. So you either there's start. No, there's, there's nobody that can tell me that they wouldn't have been better than James Milner. Oh no! Listen, is my 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 like, point my point one hundred percent. The performance he put in on Saturday <clears throat> against the Ev should have been the last time he ever set foot in a pitch for us. How many times? How many times have you and I had the conversation where we say, "I I, I tell the, the Gary Neville anecdote," or you tell the Gary Neville yeah. anecdote, and we go. Maybe today's the day that Jimbo realizes his legs have gone. It's not that he can't crush everyone in the shuttle runs. He just can't do it quickly on the pitch. And I love him and I want him to do well, but it's it, it, it's a liability. And yet I was 100% sure the club would select him today ahead of the returning Thiago, ahead of the bought for reasons Arthur, ahead of the talented kid Bacetic. Mm. I knew it was going to happen. You knew it was going to happen. I did know it was going to happen because for whatever reason, there are two lads in our squad and it does not matter how badly they play. It has never mattered how badly they play. They are held to a much lower standard than everybody else. And for years, Trev, we've had to listen to they set the standards. Pep and Linders in his book, Intensity, which, you know, available at all good booksellers now if you're worried about your energy bills and need something to light a fire with, speaks of the setting of the standards. That was bullshit for years. For years. World-class players don't take, their, don't take their mark from average players. They never have. They never have. Not in training, not on the pitch. They don't take the lead from mediocrity. Never. World-class players set the standard. World-class players set the standard of this club since 2018 when Virgil arrived. It's always been Virgil and Ali and Trent and Fab and Mo. You're telling me Mo Salah, the fittest man maybe on the planet, wouldn't train properly if James Milner wasn't telling them what to do. Like It's always been horseshit. But I'll tell you what, now, in this season, those two lads have been setting the standards and they've been dragging the rest of the team down to those standards. And today, James Milner had a look around, realised he wasn't up to it, and dragged the rest of his team down to his standard. He should have been off. I don't, I don't mean hooked. I mean he should have been sent off on nine minutes. Nine minutes. And when he wasn't, Klopp should have pulled him off. Naby Keita wasn't nearly as bad as that against Real Madrid. Naby Keita in his life has never been nearly as bad as that. And yet Klopp has hauled him off at 43 minutes and at half time in Champions League games. And that fellow was allowed to play over 60. On the back of the penalty concession and the... Um, decision, Which should have been a yellow card, by the way. Yeah, uh, and the decision or otherwise to stick an arm out quite deliberately. And then on the back of that absolutely fucking insane tackle a couple of minutes later, you'd have to say 
even the lad who's supposed to have his head most screwed on seemed to be a bit wild and a bit out of out of uh, out of sorts even mentally uh so if he's not right there we are we're going to struggle and carl i want to talk to you about napoli and, and dave you can get back in on this as well at the end if you want um because we saw a team tonight uh sort of systematically pull us apart every attack they made was with pace and determination and overlapping runs and availability for pullbacks. Now, an awful lot of that had to do with the fact that we were wide open. But I don't want to um, detract from what is a very well put together team who seem to have a way of playing. Um, I do think in my guts that on a different night, um, they wouldn't have half the freedom to do that and we would be a lot more solid defensively. We look shaky from the off, and they seem to have the weapons, Carl, to exploit that. Um, the keepers, interesting merit, I'll uh, uh, start there. They Di Lorenzo and Kim and uh, Rahmani, Oliveira, Labotka, Zambo, uh, Politano, Zielinski. Um, I'm going to ask you to pronounce the kid, um, Kvaratshelia, is it? Kvaratshelia, yeah. Kvarat Shkelia and then Ossiman as well, who was very impressive in his 40 minutes on the pitch. They have a lot of very interesting talents. Uh, the the Kvarat Shkelia kid is a, a very, very good on the ball and can pick a pass. Uh, Ossiman had the, the absolute shit scared out of our back line and seemed to have the beating of everybody for pace and then had the touch to go with it on occasion as well um politano looked good they have quite a a decent team there including uh, veterans like zelensky as well even anguisa i mean you know a fella who didn't look all that before really dominant display in midfield the kind of display that we'd really like to see in our team talk to me a little bit about them and even when they go to their bench they've got Juan Jesus they've got Mario, Mario Rui they've got Elmas who came on those two guys Lozano came on Simeone came on to great effect Zerbin did too they've got Sirigu who I think is their sub keeper Ostigard Zanoli Gaetano Raspadori and, and Dombele who, who they of course got from Spurs and didn't get a, a sniff tonight um, they are not a bad looking squad and they could do a bit of damage in this competition yeah um, I mean, we spoke about them on Scouted as usual and both Dave and myself really really like what they've put together this season um, not sure about Europe we'll see obviously how, how long that first team can stay together because I do think that that'll be key for them they have a good bit of depth there like the, some of the names you've mentioned there but obviously there is a bit of a quality drop off in some of the positions after the start at 11 but in Serie A I think they've got a great chance if they can keep that sort of first 14 or so players playing as often as possible, they, they could be right up there to try and win the title this season. Um, unfortunately, when you say like on another night, we might have done better. I, I would only agree if the night in, in that you're picking is like last season, um, because this was so, so clearly coming. Um, I mean, you see Napoli at the weekend and they had like a, a big rivalry match and so did we, you know, they played Lazio, who's uh, nominally a, a European contender in Serie A, maybe a, a top four contender if they have a good season themselves. We had our Merseyside derby and the contrast between the two performances there was just the same as it has been all season long between these two teams, to be honest. Loads of energy, loads of intensity. We saw tonight the, the power that they have in midfield, but also some really, really good control. We have had neither of those. I mean, the difference at number nine, obviously, is quite stark and... As I've said a few times, and, and again we did mention, or Simeon would have been our number one if we were buying a new number nine, and neither of the, the big two, obviously, uh, Mbappé and Haaland, were within reach for us. So Simeon would have been our, our first choice by quite some distance. So presumably there was some sort of either unavailability or off-the-scale wages or something like that, because it seems very, very difficult to believe we wouldn't have even considered him uh, if we were going for a proper nine through the middle. Uh, the rest of the team very, very much like the way that they've put it together. Um, Kim and Rahmani at the back, really good partnership very, very quickly. Lobotka, I think, is one of the most improved uh, deep central midfielders in, in most of Europe over the last six or 12 months. And uh, Kvalic Gelia has had just an unreal impact since the start of the season. Only signed for them this summer, of course, and uh, probably the best player in Serie A by, by some distance so far. 
can I ask you something? We we heard earlier on revealed that um, Dave had uh, spoken to Gags and said he had a feeling that this was not going to go well tonight. Um, you obviously did scout it um, with himself as well. And just from what you've said there in response to my point about how, you know, this has been coming, you must have also had a, a, a bit of a, a, an, angst, an angsty feeling about this probably couldn't have perceived the embarrassment that it would be. And let's, again, call spades spades. That was an embarrassment. That first <laughs> the half first was... first half was a humiliation. No a humiliation, Carl, yeah. Did you... Okay, so I guess what I'm getting at is, were you fully expecting Liverpool to have a negative result here? Um, you, couldn't, you couldn't have foreseen this bad, I guess. No, I mean, we didn't pick that we were going to have one of our worst nights in Champions League history, don't get me wrong, but yeah, we both said, I think we both predicted defeats in the end, that maybe one of us went with a, a draw just for differenti- differentiation sake and a bit of optimism, but... I, I went for a draw purely, yeah. and I, had a ho- I had a hope more than actually believe. Yeah, but both of us said, this is a game we're losing, like, um, it was, it was, unless there was a massive turnaround in our setup or in our mentality during the game it was painfully obvious we were going to get beaten here you know set aside all the nonsense in terms of like oh Klopp hasn't won in this stadium before and oh we don't usually do well against Napoli there's nothing to do with anything you know this is a different team this is a different manager for them this is a different setup and right now we're at very different points of the curve in terms of team building that's the most important and the only relevant thing here Uh, they they come into this game Really, really energetic, really, really confident, really good form. Players contributing from all over the pitch. And we have massive holes all over the pitch. The speed of play that they were capable of in the first half is what we were known for up until probably last year, really, where control became really the watchword of everything that we did. Um, But even then, you would still have real aggression in our off-the-ball work. You would have very, very good uh, in terms of spaces between the between the lines, but also the players within each of those lines, everybody backing everybody else up. None of that on show at the minute this season. None of it. Not at any point has that been seen this season up other than 20 minutes against Palace maybe and not even against Newcastle because that game we won just by throwing everything forward and they set everybody back and we happened to get the bounce. This has been coming. Maybe didn't expect it was going to be as ridiculously one-sided as it was, but I'd be perfectly honest to you, I, I take this because maybe this is like the smack around the lips that we've needed, basically. Yeah, I, I, I am hoping that, and it feels like a little bit of a forlorn hope at this stage, I will admit. Uh, not one to be dramatic at all, uh, because um, kind of everyone will know positive to the end, but I just, yeah, it, it, feels, it feels like a long shot even at this stage, which is, which is quite grim. Dave, did you want to say a word or two on Napoli before you and I get started on the details of the first half? Are you happy enough there that Carl summed it up? No, I mean, look, it was, it was obvious they were going to absolutely run all over us. It was obvious they were going to do it. They have Zambo and Gisa, who when he played with Fulham in his last year with them, was the best ball-carrying midfielder in England. I think he was like second in Europe for dribbles completed per game among central midfielders. You've got Zielinski, who's a ball of energy, and runs and runs and runs and is also a really good ball carrier and picks up really smart positions. And you've got Lebotka, who's basically who's basically N'Golo Kante, just with, you know, a, a different haircut. And they were, of course they were going to annihilate us. We played Harvey Elliott, who, as much as I like the kid, and we can get into it later, he's good on the ball, obviously, very talented player. He is fucking dreadful off the ball. Absolutely atrocious defensively. You've got Milner, who's a corpse, and you've got Fab playing in midfield by himself. And the one knock on Fab, even when everything's going well, is he's not the most mobile in the world. So you put in a not the most mobile in the world number six in there with no help from his number eights at all. What do you think is going to happen? And that right-sided number eight, Harvey doesn't cover back to help Trent at all, and you're putting Trent up against the most informed left winger in the world, so he's going to get isolated, which means Gomez has to go to him and try and help. And you've got Osman, who's one of the quickest, most powerful, most direct centre-forwards in the world, and he's just going to play in this... And we're always going to get fucking trounced. Jesus Christ, like... 
and meanwhile, we also have on that side you were discussing, we also have Mo Salah just marooned. And Mo, yeah. Salah, Mo Salah, who, like his pal Sadio Mane, used to do endless tracking work that people sometimes don't even pay attention to or give a shit about, but I love it. It makes it makes all the difference in the world to a it team. Doesn't seem to be asked to do it anymore because we know exactly. he will do it when he needs to. We saw exactly. it against Everton. He's that, the guy that prevented a goal. That's exactly by racing sixty yards. So, like, is this more of the the Pep and, Pep and Linders influence? Because it's Linders who has him marooned out on the right wing to make the most of his creativity. Because apparently, having the most goals and the uh, most goals and assists in the division last season just wasn't enough. For our assistant manager, Mo has to do a little bit more on the creative side. Is he been told to stay up there as an outlet? Is I that what that is? It's fucking bizarre, is what it is. It truly is. And then and then, you know, you you need to factor in as well the fact that when he does have the ball and even when he has space with the ball, he's not he does not look himself either. So there's a lot going on. Let's get into the first uh, section of the first half, you and I briefly. And the first this should be good. The, yes, yes. <laughs> the first decent bit of football from Liverpool comes in 13 minutes and it leads to a corner. That's what I'm going to preface this with. Because before that, it's horrific. In the first minute, there's a ball over the top and Ossiman is drifting past Ali and hits the outside of the near post with a decent effort to cut it back. It's a goal that we've seen versions of scored by Mo Salah in the past. Uh, he couldn't quite get his finish in. Then there's another chance. It's a pullback for Politano. His effort is deflected by Jimmy Miller, who sticks an arm out. And the BT commentary team, God bless them, Fletch and his pal uh, Martin Keown had a breeze what was going on. They were just wondering uh, why the game wasn't restarting. Oh, it's a penalty. Even the ball's on the penalty spot, lads. They hadn't noticed. Fair play to them. Anyway... It is a penalty, and it's a deserved penalty because it's a deliberate act of handball. And he strokes it away, does Zielinski quite comfortably on five minutes to make it 1-0. Now, I have one more thing to say before I tee you up here. Sorry, two more things. We had a corner soon after that, and they countered dangerously after mm. our corner. And this is now a fucking thing. This yes. is now a thing. A corner is now yes. a vulnerability for us. Liverpool that... set pieces are now are now an attacking mechanism for all opposition teams. Not Which just sh- not just good ones, shit ones as well. Which shows you how inherently structurally we fucked we are now. Yeah. And and something I mean when I, I'm not banging a table and saying something needs to be done. That's not difficult. Just fucking fix it. Yeah. And then the last point is fucking Jimmy Miller on nine minutes when he's wearing the captain's armband and he's just done something fucking daft, does something even dafter and goes in wild on Anguisa. It's a wild tackle and he could easily have gotten a red for it. He picks up his yellow, he does his Jimmy Milner face and he gets on with it. What a absolutely god-awful start to a football match, Dave. Yeah, appalling. And at that point, Klopp should have hauled him off and made a change because it was the only thing that was going to do anything. Because... Milner was clearly, clearly miles off the pace. But it's not, it's not Milner's fault. Like, let's be really clear here. James Milner's not the one picking James Milner to play football. It's not James Milner's fault so much that James Milner just can't play football at a high level anymore. It's not James Milner's fault that he was given a new contract in the summer. Those are all decisions made by Jurgen Klopp. And... Like I said earlier, someone needs to sit Milner down, put their arm around his shoulder and say, James, it's over. It's over. And one of three things can happen in January, but you're not going to play again until then. You can retire and we will wish you well. Go wherever you want and become a coach. You can retire and go and sit in a commentary booth or in, in a studio doing punditry. Or you find a lower league club and we will loan you to them for the remainder of the season and we'll pay your wages. If you want to carry on playing, that's fine. We'll pay you because it's our fault you have this contract. You find a club who's willing to let you play and we'll gladly let you leave on loan. But it is over at this club. Somebody needs to sit them down because that nine minutes, and it didn't even stop at nine minutes, like it got worse beyond that. 
he just stopped being involved as much because he couldn't tackle anymore because he couldn't risk a red card, although he did commit three more fouls. And his positioning just became fucking mental. But, I mean, I don't know what he's doing for the penalty. I really don't know what he's doing. It's better than what he did against United when he needlessly hurled himself to the ground and telegraphed it and allowed Sancho to just drift around him. But I I have no idea what he's doing, genuinely. Why is he crouched over? Like, what are you doing? This is fucking basic fundamental stuff. You play the season at left back. I assume at some point someone showed you how to stand up a winger and block a cross. So you just take that bit of information that you learned and you translate it into standing up someone who's about to take a shot and block the shot. Absolutely abysmal. And how I, I genuinely don't know how he didn't get a yellow card. I can only assume that the referee was just so bemused by the whole thing that he forgot to book him. Because it's fucking ridiculous. And like you said, I mean, the BT commentators, I was watching it on, on South African Supersport. It was the same thing. Oh, and it's deflected wide for a corner. And then the ball is put in the penalty spot. The game is clearly stopped. And they're still talking about this upcoming corner for Napoli. And then the commentator goes, oh, he's given a penalty. It's I'm a penalty, not sure man. why. <laughs> You're be- it, it, that's all right. It's not like you're being paid to tell us what's happening, so that's fine. Oh, and that's then, I, mean, I mean, the tackle on Zambo is an absolute outrage. I mean, that's a scandalous tackle at the best of times. But uh, look, even even when Milner could play, the poor Gosson couldn't tackle. Do you remember when he first came to Liverpool and he was getting booked like every other game? Every time he'd hur- hurl himself into a tackle, he'd end up getting a yellow card. But then, because he's James Milner and he does his James Milner face and his hand up, and I'm very sorry, you know, a little bit late to that one, even though the ball is 15 feet gone. I, he's an absolute scandal. Oh, Jesus Christ. And I, like I say, it, got, it genuinely got worse from there. It did. It's, it did. It's the problem with Milner standing up for people because he doesn't actually stand up. He just crouches lower and lower as it goes on. He does, yeah. Jack Miller, <laughs> the only man who gets smaller in as he runs. Head, in his head, he's running. <laughs> <laughs> just, it's an inevitable progress to the oh. deck with Jimbo. Uh, it's no matter if he goes down installments or not. Uh, Carl, it does get worse, so you and I are going to take it on from that point. Like I say, there was a half-decent move in 13 minutes that led to a corner. We got nothing from it. Van Dijk was actually decent then versus uh, Ossinet on uh, Ossiman, sorry, on uh, 15 minutes. Um, uh, but the kid goes down and he's in a bit of a ball and he's not doing very well. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> they are checking it again. And it's a shit show because the ref then is, call, is called to the monitor. He jogs over and we get to see some replays now. And what Virgil has done is he's trying to ease the kid off the ball. And he puts his leg across him. And Ossiman puts his leg, uh, uh, his foot beneath Virgil. It's not a deliberate stamp, but he absolutely does stand on his foot. But there's no deliberate action as such. And I... I find it very difficult, and it's not it's not Liverpool tainted glasses or tinted glasses, or maybe tainted glasses. I I don't believe it to be a foul myself. But this referee, he is absolutely dead certain when he goes and has has a look. Oh yes, I can see now that the foul is there, and he gives the penalty. Of course, it's taken by the injured player. Uh, who was rolling around in bits a few seconds ago and Ali makes a fantastic save and they miss the follow-up. I'm just going to pause there for a second, Carl, with you because I'd like to get your take on that and what you thought of it before we push through into the next section of the match. Um, I, I didn't really think it was that much of a penalty. He kind of just put his foot down where he was standing, like where that next step went rather than... Uh making an actual challenge or anything but I wasn't I wasn't really surprised that he gave it once they sort of started to have a look at it and stuff I think the only bit that annoyed me by that point because we were being so bad um it was the 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 show-stopping momentary pause the referee gave after the VAR 
uh, square, but before pointing at the spot, it was like a good two seconds of tension. He had to make sure he was seen on the exactly camera, though, that. Carl, because he had to step into the little boots. He had to walk back out of it and make sure yeah. everybody saw him. It's also it, why, until he as he ran over, he, he slowed down and walked the last three yards to build the suspense of his decision. I thought that was because he'd uh, seen a few too many referees trip over on the uh, on the running track around the side of the pitch, in fairness, that one. But all lights on Mr... Del Carro Grande and uh... does that mean Big Hill? <laughs> I think it does mean Big Hill, doesn't it? Um, not, 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 not really the way his is. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay. I was just curious. So it's 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 a tricky it's a tricky one uh, in terms of I don't. I don't understand why it's given, but it is given. And honestly, you know, the Ali saves. It, it could be one of those moments that a match spins on. But as we find out now, as you and I go on a little bit further with it, it doesn't spin on that at all, really. Um, so after the save, there is an effort by Trent, which came from nowhere. It was, a, I think, a free kick, uh, which is touched over um, and that leads to a corner. There's a second one. And from that, Trent clips a ball into Mo Salah. Mo is in space. So Trent's actually... Uh, over on the right hand side and he clips in a nice little ball to Mo I think it's with his left foot um, and Mo's in acres and Mo fails to trap the ball and I honestly at that stage was wondering what what am I watching here this makes no sense who is who is this guy and what, what have you done with Mo Salah it was a decent opportunity to say the least we actually put together a half decent move in 26 that leads to a corner again nothing comes from it and lo and behold they start to push back this time on 27 minutes, uh, Osiman is mugging Joe Gomez for fun. And then his center uh, to uh, Kvartskaya is, is, uh, is um, well, it doesn't end up where we want, it, where they'd want it to end up. It, it's hit goal words and Virgil makes a good goal line clearance. Uh, on 29 minutes, Trent puts a ball into Mo Salah centrally. He turns and he kind of hits a very tame shot straight at the keeper. And on 30 minutes, Carl, this is where we'll pause. They are 2 0 up. It's Anguisa this time. And again, it's a very interesting looking move. Uh, Kvaric Gele is involved at the start of it. Um, he does. Joe Gomez completely. Uh, this time it's on the opposite side of the park. He feeds Anguisa, who plays a simple one two, walks through us and finishes, I think, in off the base of the post. Talk me through the concession of that goal and where you think um, the, the, uh, the majority of the, the, uh, the fault lies for the concession of it and anything else in that section up until the 30 minute mark you want to mention. I don't like a lot of this section of the match. <laughs> Um, <laughs> <laughs> there are so many bad 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 bits of football here it's like it's like watching the worst kids team you've ever seen in your life except they're slightly more spread out than kids usually are uh i don't even think this was the f first time that gomez had lost the ball in that way i think this was the second time wasn't it um, there was another time later on as well, which is, is equally notable, but there was another time when he'd been bailed out. And then, uh, oh my God, it's, it's, it's so simple. How does this even happen at any level of football? Even my five-a-side team do better at this kind of situation. It's just a one-two. This is nothing clever. This is nothing ridiculous. This is just a one-two. And there's what well, our centre-back, our right-back, our defensive mid and the number eight are all there in more or less the areas they should be, and nobody does anything at all. It's just ridiculous, it really is. It, you, you can't even, you can't even analyse that. It's just stupid, that's all it is. It's so, so bad. Um, I'm not going to try and analyse, I'm not going to put blame on somebody. It's everybody's fault, they're all rubbish there. That's just pathetic. It's honestly, there's no other word for it. It's so, so ridiculously rubbish, a goal to concede. Um... I feel a bit sorry for Alisson. I don't know how he didn't get that ball out of the back of the net and just belt it at one of his teammates' heads because that yeah. man must have the, the, the control of of an absolute angel because that's the only thing I think I would have been able to do. Well, you would be furious. You would be furious. To, rightly, to, to, that was, that yeah. was babyish football. It really yeah. was. 
to to be exposed like that by just ineptitude all round it's it's very very it's 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 cruelty to 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 goalkeepers and I mean, Dave. Um, you feel free to talk about that, but we're, we're just we'll just run through to the can end. I just, of can I just on, on on the second penalty just for one sec? I, I want everybody to go back and watch that second penalty again. Be, the build up to it. Our right back is at right back. Our left sided midfielder is also at right back, and he plays the ball from there to our right sided midfielder, who then loses the ball. The ball gets played into the area where our left-sided midfielder, who's playing as an auxiliary right-back, should be. And that's how they get a simple ball through to Osman. That When I said it got worse, it that's why I mean it got worse. Milner decided, having completely shot the bed for nine minutes, that what he was going to do was he was going to freelance and take over the game. And he popped up at right-back, he popped up on the right of Fabinho on four different occasions. He decided to go and play next to Mo at one point. And Fab got the ball off Virgil at one point and turned round to play it to Milner, only to discover that Milner wasn't there. And when he turned back round, he saw Milner jogging towards him from the right side of the pitch. That's the type of imbalance that fucked us today. And on that second goal... I don't know why Harvey sprints in to help Joe with Zambo. I really don't understand why he did that. But when the ball gets played back and Harvey goes chasing the ball again and Zambo just drifts around the corner, I my assumption is Fab is flabbergasted by Harvey and what he's doing and just assumes Joe is you know going to do his job and actually go with uh, Angisa, but he doesn't because Joe is having his Dejan Lovren moment and it, it's just that the whole thing was a clusterfuck. Like, the only thing of from Klopp's quotes that I've seen that are in any way truthful are you have to be really, really bad to concede four goals with Alisson in, in the net. Like, that's... It, it, <laughs> he's the best keeper in the world. And he saved the penalty. He made a couple of big saves second half. And we still conceded four. Like, I, it, it's flabbergasting how bad we were here. Yeah, the more we talk about it, the more embarrassing it makes me feel. I'm actually fucking cringing here. I, I, honest to God, it's, 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 it's just mortifying the more we talk about this. And, and to hear the likes of yourself and Carl just sort of like... <laughs> Just almost stuck for words to describe the ineptitude. It's really interesting. And we're going to keep it going because at the, the half ends on a delightful low. And of course, we annoy ourselves a little bit by having a couple of attempts. On 33 minutes, there was a Trent free, a Virgil header downward that bounced up and I think the keeper touches it onto the bar. Um, on 34 minutes, there was a half-decent move which ended with um, a Milner in-swing ball deflected and Harvey Elliott wasn't capable of uh, finishing. I think it comes off his knee. He's at the back post uh, as the ball is coming across to him. He's on that side that he should be on in terms of coming in. Uh, uh, but uh, can't direct the attempt on target. Now, they bring on Simeone for Osterman, who had a, a good night and showed up very well, but obviously picked up a knock. And he's on the pitch four minutes, is uh, Diego's kid, uh, and he is uh, celebrating. Because yet again, yet again, Kvartskalia does print up like a kipper, and then yet again, embarrasses Joe Gomez, then centres it for Simeone to tap home. There are so many things that are wrong there. The kid doing two of our players in the way that he did. The pullback to a player who's completely unchecked and the ability for him to simply tap home. We are vulnerable now to almost all kinds of attack. You can run through us. You can play balls over the top of us. You can play any kind of a cross and certainly any pullback will leave us absolutely screwed. There's something very, very wrong here. Talk to me about that last goal if you want to pick out any specifics, Dave, and we'll move from there to the second whenever you're ready. 
Um, yeah, it's a shambles. It's an absolute shambles. And I, I just don't understand what goes through Trent's head. Like, your man just knocked the ball by you, and you've decided that you're just going to stop. You're not going to try and get back. You're not going to do anything. You're just going to stop, and you're going to watch. Now, maybe he'll make the argument that he thought Joe would deal with it. And, you know, there is an argument to be said that Joe should do an awful lot better. I still don't fully understand what Joe was trying to do. Like, he was trying to shield the ball for what purpose? And credit to the the Napoli winger, um, Kavicha. He just he out-muscles him, makes a show of him, and just rolls the ball across. And Robbo hasn't covered in to the striker, and it's a simple tap in by uh, Ed Cholito, and um, and they deserved like <laughs> you couldn't even be angry. They deserved to be three 0 up. You almost felt bad that it was only two 0 They'd annihilated us. It should have been five. It should have been five. And in a way, I wish it was five because there will still be fans tonight who will try and rationalise that in their minds and they'll come up with whatever bullshit they want and claim that, you know, there are positives to take. There's The only positive to take from tonight is that Thiago's back. That's literally it. Everything else was shit. Oh, and, and Diaz. Diaz's performance showed that if the fucking ship is sinking, that fucker will be there with a bucket trying to get the water out as it goes under. That fella won't give up. That's the only other positive. Everything else was shit. We deserved to be 3 0 down. And I was actually glad for Napoli that they got their third goal. Yeah, I can't argue with anything, anything you said there. It seems some of the, the quotes that are drip feeding through from Clapo there, it seems like he may well be having a, some sort of a come to Jesus moment. He said, until Thiago entered the pitch, I cannot remember one counter pressing situation. Everything was obvious. Why it happened, I cannot answer now. It's a really tough one to take, but I have to take it. Um, I really. I can answer. That... I can answer for him. If he'd like me to write him a detailed list, I'll put a fucking detailed list together for him. Would you, would you send him a little dossier? I think that would be good. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of dossiers, now my sources tell me that uh, Brendan Rogers, who owns the, the house that Jurgen Klopp lives in, was seen entering the building today going up into the attic and frantically looking for the dossier that bamboozled FSG years ago so he could send it to Todd Bowley in hopes of getting the Chelsea job. But remains to be seen what happens there. I, 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 Yeah, and obviously he also probably just wanted to visit that picture of himself that he keeps there like Dorian Gray uh, in the attic. Uh, we should keep... Cl- Klopp on. keeps it covered unless, there's get, <laughs> unless Brendan's coming around. You know, like in an old Irish house... There's always a picture of Jesus up on the wall. And like yeah. th- in my mom's house, my my stepfather's mother gave it to my mom and my stepfather when they bought the house. And mom put it up in the garage just because she couldn't be arsed looking for it. But they put a nail in the kitchen. And any time my stepfather's mother was coming around, they'd bring it in, dust it off and sit it up. And she died blissfully unaware that it didn't live there all year <laughs> round <laughs> yeah yeah whereas in, in in my granny's house there was a picture of uh, uh jfk and the pope uh that's that's basically... every irish house has three <laughs> pictures jfk for god knows what reason the pope because he came to ireland once and that jesus photo and that jesus picture the sacred heart every irish house had one of them when we were kids Absolutely. Uh, the second half begins with us making a change, and we're gonna we're gonna obviously try to do things a little bit different in the second half. And the first intervention, uh, Carl, is that Joel is brought on for poor old Joey Gomez, who had a a, a, a mare. Um, and on forty six min- minutes, uh, Joel's already involved, heading a corner goalwards, uh, and we think maybe things will be okay. Oh shit, four nil. 
It's Zielinski, a simple Anguisa ball over the top. I think it's Anguisa who hits the ball over the top. Ali saves well um, from the ball that's pulled back to Zielinski, but he is there, Johnny, on the spot to dink home the rebound over the keeper. And yet again, our goalie is exposed. And yet again, the simplicity with which this crowd played through us is mortifying. Now, I, I, w- I, will, give the, I will give our, our lot one thing. Our forward play continued continued to be comparatively inept. Uh, the new lads who came in did a lot of huffing and puffing. Darwin Nunes in particular was really struggling and really ineffective with most of the things that he did. But they were trying and there was effort put, being put in. And I do think there was a far, far more solid look about us with Joel and Verge together. And I'm not even vaguely surprised about that. And I don't know why anyone would be because they are clearly our best partnership and have been. But this happened before that settling in could happen. We were, like I say, 4-0 down. We'll also talk in a second about the Luis Diaz goal that um, sort of took a, a, the really ugly look off the scoreline. But in those opening minutes, I mean, I, I, don't, I haven't recorded the exact moment of the goal, but I think it's about 47. How can we not? How does that happen, Carl? How does that happen with your freshly rocketed ears from the manager telling you to, you know, concentrate on positional stuff, make sure you track runners, all those basics that you imagine that were being screamed in the faces of individuals or at least uh, reminded, uh, at least they were being reminded of them. How can we do, how is that possible that we can see such a simplistic walkthrough goal in that fashion in the first couple of minutes? I mean, this is where the, the humiliation was underlined this fourth goal. I mean, there's obviously a couple of ways where this could not sink in. People either not caring, not listening, or not really bothered because they think that it doesn't really matter and they'll be in the team again next week or whatever. Um, uh, let's assume that this you know, halftime rollicker did happen, yeah, because we don't know, but you can assume it did. I, I don't think anyone could be too uh, understated about how shit we were in that first half. So let's assume that it happened. Um, I think that message is somewhat undermined when you again leave on the worst player on the pitch, when you again don't make any more than one change, which kind of feels scapegoaty when it's a performance like that in the first half, to be brutally honest. Um, Gomez obviously had a, a, a mare. His footwork was terrible. His body position was wrong. He got robbed three times. But Milner, again, should have been sent off right before half time because he's completely taken out Lovatka, who's turned him and gone away from him. That's a yellow card all the time, mm-hmm. that foul that he did there right before half time. He should have been off at least at least once, if not twice. So he should have definitely been hooked at half time. And we know that, and we've seen it before, we've seen it against Palace and whoever else, that he can let things get away from him and commit that kind of foul. It, the game was gone. Make two subs so that it's not on one person's fault. Make two subs so that you give someone, Artur, the chance to integrate themselves into the team. What difference is he going to make now if he comes on on 45 or 75, really, for this game? He cannot be a professional player, even training on his own, cannot be that short of match fitness that in a game which was probably going to be paid closer to walking pace in the second half, he couldn't possibly do those extra 25 minutes of of running about and playing football. I, I just don't believe that at all. So I think that the focus might have been... Um, either misinterpreted or, or maybe, like I say, had the edge taken off it by, by not hauling off two, three players at once, maybe, because we've seen other managers certainly happy to do that, and there could have been no complaints if anyone had been gone off, really. Um, there was also a little bit of, a, obviously, a, a change in shape before half time, and then we went back to it, and then we seemed to be changing again there at the start of the second half. But that was quite difficult to tell in the first half because there was a point quite early on I thought we'd gone to a double pivot in midfield but it was actually just Milner on the wrong side of people yeah. everybody else was still where they were supposed to be so yeah. I think at the start of the second half we did actually purposely switch up there to a, to a double pivot it looked much more um, purposeful let's say in where people were but I mean what can you say about it, it we, we just carried on as we had done um, I think concentration was all over the shop from a number of people. We saw even like Diaz first half tried to control the ball, missed it by about two feet and it bounced up and hit his hand. Gomez tripped over the ball about four times, including for a couple of the goals. 
Firmino tried to take the ball on the turn and it just completely ran under his feet quite early on in the match. Uh, Salah had the well, miscontrol. I mean, it just went on and on and on. The whole well, thing. Well, he clearly let the, the decent couple of games get to his head and he's been on the piss again because he was drunk again tonight. I mean, absolutely, like, <laughs> absolutely <laughs> atrocious. The, 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 the fourth goal, by the way, is just Matip's only just come onto the pitch yeah. and he gets caught three yards behind the rest of the defensive line. That's it's as simple as that. But like, it's, but even before that, it's not. It's not just the one player. That's what I'm saying. There's there's still no pressure on the ball. Oh no, it's it's, it's so easy no, for them. Yeah, it's so it's easy just, for them. The whole thing was just. Like, ugh. It really then, really annoys me. The goals we've conceded this season, which is simply born of whatever defensive things happen, the goal comes from no pressure on the ball. Yeah, it's like our number one trait. Forget the word intensity for a minute, what all of that stems from or what all of that becomes, where that energy and that aggression and the pressing, all of that, what that is, is put pressure on the ball in twos and threes, not just in... Firmino was the only one doing it in the first half. I will say that for him. He went around, must have been at one point, he chased about four or five consecutive passes and nobody yeah. ran anywhere with him. Not with him, not behind him, not to the no, next... They all kind of ran nobody. away from him. It was absolutely. They all just let him go and do his thing, and it was, oh, it was, it was a and The number of goals we've conceded as a result of that, because there's no pressure on the ball, it's just stupid. It really is. It's, it's been like that all season, Carl. Yeah. There's yeah, no yeah, pressure on the ball. Saying. There's no follow up. There's nobody with any kind of positional discipline in the eight positions to defence. Like we've talked about, it. I just I don't understand what's wrong with Trent. <laughs> Joe, I can kind of excuse the guy didn't barely play any football for two years. He's He's just, he was off it tonight. He got, look, he got destroyed by two really, really, really special players. That's what it comes down to. Yeah. Like Gomez, because Trent just couldn't be arsed and because Osman decided to go park himself on Joe because it's the easier option than parking himself on Virgil, he basically had to try and deal with the two of them by himself. Like, he played really badly. There's no question, but... I don't know that there's a defender in the world who could try and deal with those two lads. Not even Virgil. Virgil struggled with Osterman. If you'd added Kavicha to the fucking mix, he'd, he'd have got destroyed as well. So, uh, look, a lot of it just stems from... Th there is something off at Liverpool right now. There is something yeah. off at Liverpool right now. So, some something very definitely is, and again, you come full circle. I, 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 these things, things like this matter. You, if you are going to have hubris to bring out a book and publicize it and talk about it endlessly and it's all over the social medias and we're all talking about it and i i for one couldn't wait to read it and get a copy of it and get it if you're going to call it intensity you have to acknowledge we all have to acknowledge as we're as we're, we're giving out here that it, it, it that's feeding off the back of a thing that was real it was a thing that was absolutely clear in the dna of this team and now like you both said it is not and therefore, something is very, very awry. It's not simple. It will not be a simple fix. I don't know what it is. That's the thing. Like, on the cover of that book, it says intensity, and at the bottom of the front cover, our identity. Well, this team now does not have an identity. And I think that I, I think that sums it up. I think that sums it up, and until that's recovered, uh, we're going to struggle. I'm going to just say that I, w I want to put Luis Diaz in a little um, uh, protective uh, sphere and say that nobody can say anything bad about him because I thought he was outstanding in a ridiculously awful situation tonight. I thought Alisson can stand in there in the sphere with him. Um, after that, I'm struggling. I'm struggling. I liked, I liked seeing Thiago. Thiago. I liked Thiago, seeing Thiago came on and he, yeah. and he booted a few people. Do, do he you went know in what, and he booted a few people because it fucking was needed. What was best about Thiago's cameo performance was not his silky skills. It was the fact that he was hard as fuck. He got stuck in. It was great to see. I actually loved that, I have to say. Yeah, so that he can step into the sphere as well. That's it. The ball bounces away then. And, of course, Luis Diaz does score a fantastic bloody goal on 48 minutes where he cuts in and does that. Uh, what is now almost like a trademark finishing at the base of the post. It's a beautiful goal. But we're just going to look at whatever of the match remains and see if there's anything worth talking about. 
um, on 50 minutes. Uh, Diaz tries the same thing again and narrowly hits it over this time. 53 minutes, a half decent robo ball in. They make a couple of subs. Lozano comes on. Um, uh, this is it. Serbin comes on. Um, Politano on. And uh, Kvice goes off. On 61, Trent puts a cross in. Uh, we see an outrageously powerful header from Luis Diaz um, from quite a distance out uh, is saved by the keeper. And we bring on our trio. Now, this is probably not a bad time to pause because honestly, fuck all happens after this. I think Lozano scuffs one wide at one stage. Um, we bring on Arthur for Harvey on 76 minutes. Uh, there's a half decent move on 67 minutes with uh, um, an opportunity for Darwin Nunes to shoot. He should do a lot better with it. But we bring on Darwin, we bring on Thiago, and we bring on Jota. That's for uh, Bobby Firmino, for Jimmy Milner, and Mo Salah. And it's very interesting. You're taking off Bobby and Mo, uh, and you're taking off Jimmy Milner, who we, we all agree should have been gone long ago. And you have good players to replace them with. You've got Jota and Darwin. And this should be, okay, well, this should be a a joyous moment where we're replacing two of our strikers with two of our other strikers. Um, And I know, Dave, you said, and I'll start with you on this, you said that you thought um, what they did at least showed uh, endeavour. But but it was it was very blunted, wasn't it? I mean, oh it wasn't, yeah, it, it was yeah. like going up and trying to headbutt your way through a door rather than just using the handle. Like <laughs> there's nothing good about it now. But no. you know, at least they tried. Whereas the rest of the cunts were sat in the hall just waiting for someone else to come on come along and open the door. Didn't even make an effort. But you know what? What really wound me up? Sixty minutes or fifty nine minutes, whatever it was, they start taking their lads off. They're like, right, that's it, job done. Game over. You come off now. Have a nice sit down. Have yourself some lovely rest. And Milner's still running around. And Klopp <laughs> is still stood there with a bemused look in his face like, oh, I wonder what I can do to fix this. Yeah. Like, get him off the fucking pitch. They're taking the piss at this point. There's over half an hour left and they're resting people. They are laughing at you. And, oh, Jesus Christ. I'd say I'd say Spalletti was literally pissing himself on the inside. I mean, he could not have seen this turning out quite as well as it did. You know what, man? I'm going to finish with you in a minute. And Carl, I'm going to give you a chance to, if there's anything in the second half that there, there seems to be very little incident that you want to talk about, absolutely fine. But let's start wrapping this up um, because it's a mad one. And I feel like we can we can only say how dejected we are and how abject the team was so many times. So let's wrap it up with you now with your final thoughts on that whole shit show. I never want to see a performance like this again. It's pretty much the only way I can sum it up. This was this was childish football. And the only positive you can take out of this game is that it has to be the wake-up call for us, for all of us, everybody involved at that team, to realize that what we're doing now is not the way is whatever has been the plan whatever has been the idea behind what's happening is not working this is not what football is this is not what liverpool's football is and if we carry on playing like this wolves maybe they won't do to us what napoli have done they've got certainly the build-up players but not the 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 focal point in attack but ix in a week from now they will wipe the floor with us and then so will so many other teams domestically if we keep playing like this um it's it's not huge differences that uh, between Liverpool this season and Liverpool last season and the season before in terms of spaces and in terms of you know players, individuals and all the rest of it. But the things that they're doing and the things that they're not doing cumulatively is an absolute gulf away. And it took us a long time to get to that point. You cannot just turn it around in a week. So whatever we're facing right now... I worry a bit at the minute that it's going to have to get quite a bit worse uh, before we find plenty of answers. Not necessarily every single game, but there are going to be very, very difficult games ahead um, if we repeat this sort of performance level and this sort of lack of energy level, because this was just, honestly, there's no other word for it, but pathetic. It was childish. This was just a disgrace of a night. I, I, I kind of like where you're going with that, because it does really put the emphasis back on uh the way the team was set up and the performances of those players and as you say 
uh it's it's the yeah it's the, yeah the childishness of it the just the lack of maturity lack of sophistication it was just it, it, it's hard to get your head around it's really really hard to stomach uh and it's it's an embarrassment I'm, I, I, that's, I hate that for this club I hate that for this club uh, Carl I doubt you have any I, I doubt you, you were even in the mood to gather any stats and I'm, I think I'd be almost afraid to hear them if you had but if you do fair enough throw them out please uh, and can you let folks know what's coming up during the week because <laughs> despite the fact that we are currently awful uh, matches are coming thick and fast as is no doubt uh, content from yourself yeah, I, I purposely haven't gone stat searching today, I'm afraid. So um, I'll, I'll let listeners off from a, from like a soul-destroying <laughs> sentence or two. Um, if, if you do feel like you need to um, get a little bit more closure of tonight, then uh, obviously I've done a, a write-up on the indie of, of the horror show of the uh, Stadio Armando Diego, whatever the hell it is. It's not a, a ground which has been happy for us, whatever the name has been, but... Uh, there's one on the indie for tonight. We'll have Scout at the head of Wolves and then Scout at the head of uh, Ajax next midweek as well. You know, uh, going and having a read of what Carl comes up with is always actually a good way of processing a match afterwards. So if you haven't been doing that on a regular basis, go and do it. Get following him on the socials and check the links and get yourself your eyes around those articles and listen to those match, uh, podcasts with Dave. And the others, and Dave, what about yourself? Any wrap-up thoughts? I mean, it's it's kind of hard to to say anything new at this stage because it, it's, it's 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 there's an exasperation level that it's hard to get past. Um, but is there anything you'd like to sign off with? I I I don't know. I don't know. I just I don't understand how like when you have the talent that we have. I just don't understand how it's been allowed to get to this point. I I don't know what the issue is, but there's there's a deeper issue here where something has gone wrong in the preparation for this season. Either the players have been overworked and came into the season kind of right up against their limit, which is what caused the injuries and has so many of them looking leggy, or they were underworked in pre-season and they're just kind of half-cooked and not ready to perform. I I really don't know what it is. But something has gone wrong in the planning. Something has gone wrong with the recruitment, obviously, this summer. Um, And I saw an interesting couple of tweets from Dan Kennett the other day where he talked about, you know, we used to have, like, a, a real process for how we would recruit players, and we used to plan meticulously. And at some point in recent years, we've gone away from that process. And it has led to what we what we see now. It's what cost us last season and the year before that. So something there there are multiple things not right with the club. And I do think Michael Edwards' departure was a much bigger issue than people tried to make it out to be. Uh Julian Ward in time might go on to be a good sporting director. But Michael Edwards was the best sporting director in world football. And when you lose him, no matter who replaces him, there's going to be a drop-off. There just is. There's there's a reason that Manchester United and Chelsea are currently trying to entice him to their clubs with enormous bags of money. There's a reason he's getting offers from other sports. Like, other sports are looking at this guy and thinking, this guy's a fucking genius. Bring him in. He can get things going for us. Real Madrid, as the Mauritian one points out, they tried to recruit uh, Michael Edwards as well. You know, like, people forget, it wasn't just Jürgen that built this team. It was Jürgen and Michael. And now one of them is gone. And something is off. And people aren't being held accountable. And I don't know, like... I know people say, oh, well, Klopp didn't have any other, other option other than to play... Milner because, you know, Arthur apparently wasn't ready to play more than 15 minutes, which just it seems like absolute nonsense. Like, I don't care that he hasn't been training with teammates. He was training by himself with a coach all summer. He's fit enough to play. There's no way he would have been worse than Milner. But there's also the fact that we have a fully fit midfielder currently sitting at home. 
been left out of the European Cup squad, sitting at home, not injured. But the line is that he is, he's injured, but he's not injured. And that is unforgivable, that that really good player is sat at home, not injured, and we're playing James Milner, who isn't fit to lace the fella's boots. Is he qualified to make him a sandwich, let alone replace him in midfield? If you genuinely believe that, then this malaise that's afflicting the club could be a whole lot deeper. I mean, you're you're looking there at something that would be the antithesis of the sort of atmosphere that Klopp has been trying to build with the with with his group over the years. That could be poison. Uh, but it, it wouldn't be the first. Like, look, I've I've said for a couple of years, Naby should look to leave the club because of how he's been treated at different times. Now, he hasn't always been his, his own fucking best friend or whatever. You know, at times he has just shit the bed a couple of times in big games, whatever. And he is frequently injured, so it's hard to put too much faith in him. But he's not injured. He's not injured. He tried to force a move in the last days of the season. And then all of a sudden, oh, he's injured. Well, what injury is it? Oh, we don't know. What do you mean you don't know? What do you mean you don't know? You pay medical staff and sports science scientists hundreds of thousands a year. You don't know. Jordan Henderson got hurt, and four days later, we had a specific timeline on his return. Naby got hurt a month ago. Hurt. A month ago. And we still don't know. And when one of the uh, journalists asked Klopp in a press conference in a part that was put in the, the bit they don't allow them to put out to later, he said something about a thigh injury and Klopp looked at him as if to say, like, what are you talking about? Bollocks, he's been called up to the Guinea squad. If he was out for months, as Klopp has kind of let on that he's going to be, he wouldn't be called up to the squad regardless. It appears Guinea know. <laughs> yeah. Of course, they even rang him and said, are you injured? He went, no, I'm sitting at home. No, I'm sitting Hold here. Hold me up, boss, I want to play football. Bollocks oh. is he injured. If he was injured, we'd have been told what was wrong with him. Or we'd have some sort of guideline on when he's coming back. Four days it took him to tell us. Henderson's out for about three weeks. He's had a scan. Clock, Kayla got hurt a month ago. We don't know what's wrong with him. What do you mean you don't know? What do you, what, who's doing their job? Like, oh, Jesus Christ. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Look. Jürgen needs to get his act together and he needs to get these players' acts together and he needs to stop his assistant manager writing books and doing interviews. He might just need to start cracking heads. Like, Jürgen's, Jürgen's the best in the world, but he's the fucking worst as well. Because he wouldn't lie... He's far too loyal, which is both a blessing and a curse because it's great for team chemistry, but at the same time, some of that loyalty has always been misplaced. And he's just never the type that's going to throw the players under the bus. Like today, he should have come out in the press afterwards and said, they're all a bunch of shithouses. They're all cowards. That was a cowardly performance. That's what he should have done. It, it, instead, he comes out, oh, we might need to, you know, reinvent ourselves and this and that. If wolves are watching, they'll be laughing. Why would they be laughing, Jürgen? Tell us exactly why. Because they were shit tonight. Just say it. Just say it. Say they were shit. Why did you take off Joe Gomez? Because he was shit. Why did you take off James Milner? Because he was shit. Just fucking say it for once. Just for once. Just light, lit into them. Just fucking tear them apart for once. But he never will. He never will. And it's both a good thing and a bad thing. And it's the same thing with the owners. Like, he'll never ever publicly criticise the owners. He'll never ever come out and publicly make a demand. And again, that's a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing because there's good harmony. It's a bad thing when you've got a bunch of lads that don't want to spend any money. Like FSG are like, Jürgen doesn't want to spend any money. Brilliant. Fucking new yachts all round, lads. Midfielder, my arse. Getting fucking Linda a new fucking cocktail dress and we're hitting the clubs. Oh. 
The, those the whole kicking thing is a shambles. Tonight, Dave. I'm fucking high as fuck, lads. I took them before we started to, to numb the pain and they've kicked in. And I tell you, I could do a better job right now on my crutches than James Milner did tonight. That's a fact. That's a fa- There would have been at least one of them leaving on a stretcher. I'd have been leaving on the same stretcher, sharing it with him. But it would have been fucking my victory. I, If we play like that, look, the thing is, we get Wolves on Saturday. If we play like that, they'll beat us. Then we get Ajax. If we play like that, they'll tear us apart. Uh, from there, it's Chelsea away, who may well then be managed by Graham Potter. Um, then it's an international break. whoop de doo We come back and we play Brighton. Then we've got a Champions League game against Rangers. Uh, in the league, then we get we go to Arsenal, so that should be fun. And then we get City at home. Great. Do you remember not many weeks ago we were saying, well, we just need to make sure that we don't lose any games in the run up to City or stay that we so that that game can be a, a decider uh, as we head into the back end of the the first half of the season. <laughs> blah blah blah. I mean, the the God love us, God love us, and our little innocent naive heads as we were thinking about what wonders lay ahead, how could we possibly have foreseen this incredible fucking shit show that's on display? And, you know, the idea of it turning around very, very quickly does seem naive in the extreme. However, we must maintain some sort of hope. Dave, when will it be safe to listen to you on your various shows again? (laughs) (laughs) Well, tomorrow I'll be doing the Daily Rage. Uh, Yeah, around lunchtime. The Daily Red will return on Friday. Uh, there'll be a scouted with Carl hopefully tomorrow maybe for uh, for Wolves uh, there'll be two footed tomorrow which thankfully is questions day and I might just pretend that these games to, that this game tonight didn't happen I might yeah. just let on that it didn't happen uh, so yeah I mean what a load of shite Jesus Christ. do you know what the worst part is right and I blame I blame you I blame Matchett, I blame Drinkle, and fucking Gibbs, and Hopcroft, and Tandon, and Chatra, and Seti. I blame all these. When that second goal went in, I had just turned the TV off, I didn't have to do this tonight, and just said, that didn't see it, that didn't happen, and just blissfully gone on with the rest of my week. And, oh, yeah, get into the weekend. Yeah, we haven't played since the Everton game, so hopefully we get a reaction. Uh, But I had to sit and suffer. I'm a wounded man here. I'm a wounded man who's not in his best uh, mental state either, having been abandoned for a week, trying to fucking make my way up and down the stairs by myself, trapped in the house, the only person I see now is the neighbor who comes to walk the dogs three times a day. And I'm stuck here. And I had to sit through that. Oh, man, please, everybody, listen to Dave's show tomorrow and the next day. Because clearly, if the spiral continues, it's going to be, <laughs> it's going to be worthy of fucking all sorts of prizes. Uh, or, I or, sleep. Or, yeah, yeah well, there you go. <clears throat> Ah, uh, we'll we'll put Dave out of his misery. We'll put Carl out of his misery, and everybody else who's been. We put James me. Milner out of his misery as well. <laughs> Does that lend a lot of mine? Let me tell you. <laughs> Have you ever seen Old Yeller? <laughs> <laughs> it's fucking time. <laughs> We can all have a big cry at the end. Oh, right. Let's wrap it up. Uh, That was a very interesting show. Thanks for listening to us live. If you've joined us on Discord and uh, the comment thread is always very, very interesting. Uh, Thanks to Dave and Carl and Guy for producing and all of you guys for participating live. This has been raw. It's been a tough one. And if you're looking for a little bit of uh, sort of calm appraisal, uh, myself and Jan will be doing I'll be on the spot tomorrow night although I have a feeling that even the, the big man will be a little bit flabbergasted so that's another show to add to your roster if you can manage to think about Liverpool at all over the next couple of days I've been Trev Denny you heard Dave Hendrick you heard Carl Matchett we'll talk to you soon we hope you enjoyed listening to this Anfield Index show please be sure to subscribe to our channel so future podcasts find their way to your device automatically 
there's nothing quite like fan engagement, and we'd love to know what you think of anything discussed on this show. The best way to get in touch is over on our free Discord community, where both podcasters and listeners debate the hottest LFC topics 24-7. Sign up free now at anfieldindex.com forward slash discord. You won't regret it. You can also follow us on Twitter at Anfield Index and find us on Facebook by searching for Anfield Index. Oh, and before you go, we'd love it if you could leave us a five-star review on your favourite podcast app. It only takes a couple of seconds, and it means the world to the people who create these free shows.